So good evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much to, to Chris DeSorin, to the Leadership Council, for inviting me here to speak with you tonight. I'm um, really excited. It's been a while since I've, I've been able to, to come out. And um, just want to give a shout out to our team that did come. So Tom Shank and Nick Lucius, um, both uh, members of the City of Chicago Department of Innovation and Technology, I know who are well known to this group. Um, also, thank you to some of our uh, vendor partners who came tonight as well. Um, talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so uh, I figured I would start a little bit, uh, for those of you, I, I know some of you and some of you I don't, so I figured I would start off by actually just doing an introduction longer than three words, so my apologies. Um, and Raul, your comic relief, you, 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 uh, you, you volunteered, so feel free to, to add into that. <laughs> um, so anyway, so I, I, uh, I am CIO of the city of Chicago, and um, I did not really set out to become CIO of the city of Chicago. So, you know, I actually have a background in library and information scientists and thought that that was going to be my life. With the, with the difference in that I actually worked in preservation, so I would never handle books or materials that irresponsibly. So, um, so, so that, that, that's, uh, that would not exactly be me, but close. Um, so I don't know if anyone knows what that particular uh, flag is from, but Party Girl with Parker, Parker Posey, one of my favorite movies. So anyway, uh, a little fun fact. So I, I have a background in library and information sciences, but that actually is where I got my grounding in technology and where I built my first website and got really excited about the power of technology to uh, to make information available, to democratize things, to uh, preserve information in different ways. And, and, and so that sort of took me off on a path. And I, um, I, you know, I ended up moving into educational technology um, at McGraw-Hill Education here, where I worked with some really amazing people. Um, you know, many of them uh, are in various different um, professions these days, but I, one of them I can credit, specifically Fran, with the idea of moving into government. So Fran at McGraw-Hill, she said to me one day, um, after it was, you know, we were a little tired, we'd been doing a lot of work, um, our, our production schedules for technology were very much um, around this print textbook, and so she said to me one day, you know, I think you might really like working in government IT, and I know that they're actually hiring. Would you ever consider applying? And she had no skin in the game. She just thought that was something I might want to do. And so I had never thought about that before. And I think many people, especially in technology, never think about the idea of actually bringing their skills to government. And so I thought, you know, yes, I like the idea. So I decided I would apply. And it took a really long time, uh, from the time I applied to the time I got hired. One of the first lessons of, in government is that hiring and procurement will always take a really long time. Um, but I persisted and I decided to, to come. So um, I've been around for a while. I started in 2008. So I've spanned actually administrations and I've got to see change in a meaningful way happen over that time. Um, so when I first started, I had the opportunity to work in the digital inclusion space. And so um, I helped write our digital excellence action agenda. Um, I worked in, with many communities on building smart communities plans in uh, leveraging our uh, broadband technology opportunity program grants through the Recovery Act to implement many exciting things in communities. Um, I also got to work on something called open data starting in 2009, which really excited me. Um, so I came from that library background, if you remember, and so for me, as a librarian, as an archivist, we believe very strongly in both preserving and providing access to information. So to me, this was a really, really great opportunity to marry some of the things I loved in a meaningful way. And so I was our first open data program manager. So you know, obviously, John Levy is now an open data program manager under Tom Shank. Um, you know, I had the opportunity, we were a small but scrappy team, which often describes what we do in government, small but scrappy. Um, and we, we knew from the beginning we had to be sustainable. So um, we started that process with automating our, our information from our source systems to um, the data portal. 
Um, we went with Socrata because it was easy for us to get up and running. Um, there are a lot of decisions we made early on there that were driven by sort of smaller amount of resources, but a, a real desire to make this information available in a meaningful way. And so you'll see there, and I forgot to credit him on the slide, so I'm going to credit him um, uh, via voice, but uh, Dan O'Neill, uh, who was a real advocate for open data, he actually uh, you know, has documented quite a bit of the history of Chicago and open data. And this happens to be uh, a hackathon held at Google um, in September of 2011. So I circle where I actually was sitting because you can't actually see me, but Dan did manage to capture me by uh, a really uh, elegant looking segue there uh, on the phone. So uh, there is that documentation. So you know there were folks here uh, in that picture that you probably recognize. I see the back of Steve Vance. Um, I see Joe jo Jamruska, I see Brian Fitzpatrick, I see Clint and Chris Metcalf from Socrata. There's a lot of folks that are in that picture who are still around today and who have been meaningful members of sort of this open gov community for some time. So I, I've been, you know, I was, I was lucky to, to participate in that early on. So I talked a little bit about some of the projects they started working on. Um, the, the first you'll see there's a picture of Norma Sanders and I when we were uh, launching in Auburn Gresham as a smart community and back in 2010 we had these kiosks that were being touchscreen kiosks that were being uh, deployed as part of that. Um, my favorite uh, my favorite note of a uh, Dan O'Neill picture that got picked up by Lifehacker has to do with our work we did with Code for America and opening up the open 311 API and so there's a picture of myself and our Code for America fellows um, ben, Rob, Angel, and Jesse, along with Dan O'Neill, John Tova, um, and, the, and the mayor talking to him about that project. And so um, if you want to talk about how to see your local officials, that is actually the photo that's used. Um, so that's, that's one of my favorite things. Um, I referenced the donuts in the corner because we, I spent, a, I, I ate too many of those as we were developing a system ahead of the NATO summit called Windy Grid, which I know that Tom has talked to you about before in the past, and which was the first version of what became Open Grid, um, a, a key, you know, information system for, for uh, really demonstrating the value of open data in, in Chicago. Um, some other things that I've worked on, uh, just up there, the, the most recently, I have been focusing more in, on internal projects. So I started off as a project manager, then I uh, started heading up our project management office, and when I did that, I started moving more towards internal projects, and I got to do things like help migrate our city to Office 365 from an on-premise email system. Um, I also helped coordinate moves of data centers. So I know these were things that Brenna Berman, our former CIO, talked to you about when she was here. Um, and these were things that I actively got to work on and really helped transform the city from an internal perspective. So um, this was a thank you from our Code for America fellows that was written that I, I really appreciate. So I thank both John and Dan, um, who you know, had contributed considerably. But they said, from Danielle, we learned how the hard daily work of rewiring the legacy systems of a city is done. And I think that that's sort of no greater compliment I could get than um, than that. It is. It can be difficult trying to transform uh, government and government technology from old systems to new ones, but we're actively working on that and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So we've made some progress, but we certainly have a ways to go. Um, so starting back to where we are now, um, this is the vision that guides us and guides us still. Um, so as a responsive city, um, where technology really fuels inclusion, engagement, innovation for everyone. So this is our guiding vision that, that all of our work stems from in, in Chicago. And so how are we putting that into practice now? So some of the things that we've been doing more recently is starting to think about how we put people at the center of our work. So I talked about also coming from that background in library and information sciences, and a lot of those schools are also schools that focus on human-computer interaction and thinking about end users, right? So, how, how do we start to employ some of those techniques in what we're doing at the city? Because we certainly know we can do a better job of addressing our users, of creating better experiences. Um, so that is one of the, the focus areas now. 
So one way we're doing that is by partnering with the Chicago Public Library. So the Chicago Public Library got a grant from the Gates Foundation to bring in IDEO and build a design, tool, a design thinking toolkit for libraries. So they have trained several of their staff members on how to use these techniques. And, and I know Eric Vasquez, another um, great colleague of ours, has been starting to use these techniques in the office of the city clerk as well. But it, we're partnering with the library to help bring these techniques into our department so that our staff starts thinking of using these techniques as we build programs and services. And again, we're starting from the inside, so thinking about how we as a service department actually deliver and work with our various departments who want to leverage tools and technology to do their jobs more efficiently and effectively. So another area that we've had some focus on is the last time our city's website was updated was in 2010. So it's been some time. So we've recently taken some incremental steps to, to update that. So this was the, the previous version. Um, and our, our current version, which was launched in, in October, does a few different things. So we implemented the Twitter bootstrap framework um, to make it mobile responsive. We got rid of that terrible blue background, the orange text. We went with Chicago colors. Um, we brought the search toolbar up in center. We indexed all of the sister agency sites. So as a quick aside, I don't know if everyone understands the differences between the city proper and sister agencies, but the city proper doesn't necessarily have purview over what we call sister agencies. So um, the CTA, the public schools, the city colleges, the public building commission, the Chicago Housing Authority, all of these agencies have their own sites. But our residents don't understand that. So when they come to our site, they may be looking for information on those sites. So we wanted to take a step to make it a little easier to find that information. So now when you search, you will actually get results that are returned that are from all of those sites as well. So an incremental step to make it a little easier for residents to find that information. Um, and so we, we really, we, we also asked for feedback. And so thus far, the feedback has been not great to be honest. So what we, you know, so, so that's, that's, and that's fair, right? So we know that we have a ways to go here, but we knew that we didn't want to let, uh, you know, perfect be the enemy of the good in this instance. And we wanted with, we wanted to be able to make some improvements, especially given that more than half of our users are mobile users uh, quickly. And then in the interim, we wanted to take some different steps to help us think more holistically about design in the city. Um, so we are uh, actively in the hiring process and hoping to wrap this up soon to hire um, a, a director of digital experience and design that really will help guide work going forward and hopefully take away some of that disjointed experience you have if you come to the city's website today. Another major thing we're doing that will address sort of our resonance experience with us is is modernizing our 311 system. So I talked a little bit about Open 311. That was an API that was released so that third parties could both write and read into our existing system. Um, and it's really limited today. It only has uh, 14 different types of service requests when we have hundreds. Um, but it's limited because it's based on a system that was implemented in 1999. And it's largely a back office system. So we have a very old system um, and now we are actually looking at, at modernizing that. So what we're doing is starting with our departments and actually looking at their existing business processes to see how can we actually improve those before we move into a new system. Um, and folks at Catalyst Consulting are helping us do that work right now who are back in the corner here if you're interested in talking to them more later. Um, so they're a key partner in that. But also we, we hope to have um, our, you know, our director of digital experience and design also weigh into what is this experience that, that, that our residents are going to get? How do we incentivize residents to sign up? The new, the new platform will be more engaging. So we'll have the ability for people to communicate with us through a variety of channels. So if you want to text, if you want to tweet, if you want to call, you can do all of those things. And so, and then also you'll have the ability to sign up and we can more proactively send information to you. So how do we think about incentivizing people to sign up for those things so that they can get information that's relevant for, for you? 
And then starting in uh, next year, so we, this is one of the areas of action that we would like to follow up with this group, we'll be actually rolling prototypes out of the new system. And so we want to get resident feedback on those prototypes so that by the time the system is finished, it's not something that people don't want to use, it's something that people feel invested in and, and, and is useful um, and that will get great engagement um, through, through uh, the new system. Another area of focus is actually our smart lighting program. So in um, partnership with the Department of Transportation and the Chicago Infrastructure Trust, the city is converting uh, um, over almost 280,000 street lights uh, to LED, which will result in a lot of cost and energy savings. But in conjunction with that, we're also deploying a citywide lighting management system. So that's um, going to mean a mesh network, uh, control nodes that are going to collect information about um, the lights themselves, so we'll know automatically when they're out, we'll know how much energy is being used. Um, and then we're going to use that data to actually integrate with our new 311 system. So, and I don't know if anyone knows this, but the 311, like street lights, is one of our most popular service requests, right? You call, you have to tell us that your street light is out, and that's frustrating. We also know that not all residents will call and report these things, right? They assume someone knows, they're going to take care of it. Um, so we may not see equitable reporting of these outages. Um, so as a result of having the nodes that can communicate via this wireless network, we'll be able to inter, you know, in, uh, integrate that information into 311, automatically open a ticket, and then ideally at the end of this we can tell you, instead of you telling us, when we'll be there to fix it, as opposed to you telling us that there's something wrong to begin with. So I think that this is the beginning of really being able to leverage um, sensors in our, in our city to be more proactive about the work that needs to be done. And this is, uh, if you go to chicagosmartlighting.org, you can see the progress of installations. So this was the most recent snapshot. They are prioritizing the deployment of lights in areas where um, there are higher incidents of crime. Um, so that, that is the, if you notice the locations, that is exactly the, then the strategy to, to help improve safety in those neighborhoods. Another way that we're leveraging sensors to uh, be more responsive and to you know, provide a platform for collaboration around urban challenges is through our partnership with the Urban Center for Computation and Data. Um, and so that's a joint initiative of the University of Chicago and Argonne National Labs. They have created a platform called the Array of Things, which is a network of sensor nodes which are being deployed across the city. Um, there are uh, about 20 up right now with more that are coming. Um, the data will be available in early 2018, and so that's another time where we really like to come back and talk with this group about leveraging that information. Um, and so this, you know, there'll be a variety of data that this will collect, the uh, air quality, uh, climate information, uh, it'll be uh, noise, vibration, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, so all of this information will be available and it will be available openly um, on the University of Chicago's Planario platform. And then we're also working with Tom, Tom's team is working on um, ways to make that information available through the city's tools as well. Um, so the, the, the array of things will be that platform that cities can come together with researchers and with developers to and our, our residents and communities to think about how we solve urban challenges. So if we know that there, if we think there's an issue with air quality, we'll have more data to be able to address that. We'll have a early warning system and ways for the Department of Public Health to direct their environmental inspectors or resources. We'll be able to devise applications that can uh, create safe walking routes for folks with asthma. So there's a number of applications that we're really excited about. So when the data is available, um, we'll, we'll really uh, look forward to coming and talking with you again. Um, I know a lot of you already know about the work that Tom's team is doing, but you know, we, open data con continues to be important. A couple of things, obviously, that will come out of some of the work we've already talked about. Um, the Open 311 API. So currently I mentioned that it is limited to 14. As we move 14 different types, as we move forward with that project, we'll be opening, it, opening up all types. So instead of being limited to just you know, the, the most frequently requested, you'll be able to have a full picture of everything that's happening through that system. 
Um, and then again, the array of things data will be av available in early next year. On the analytics side, I think Tom has talked a little bit about his lead, the Lead Safe project that his team is working on. Um, and it's an, a, an API that will provide hospitals with information about um, health risks uh, for, for their patients, their children that they, they uh, are, are, are helping. Um, another area that continues to be a focus is ensuring equity, equity and accessibility. So we mentioned that the, the website um, changes, so many of those changes we made were also to make the website more accessible to screen readers and other tools um, that individuals with disabilities would use in order to access our information. Um, we made the font larger, we made it uh, the background white, so a lot of the standard uh, tools, the, the decisions that were made went towards creating a more accessible website. Um, another project I know that has been talked about here is the municipal ID. So, uh, the municipal ID is something that the clerk's office is working on, but our team is advising as well um, to create a universal card that will allow our residents to access many different services, including libraries and the CTA. Um, and so that, that will be coming uh, in the new year as well. Our team, um, not everyone knows, also updates and supports the public technology at all of our libraries, our senior centers, our community centers. So while it's not the most glamorous thing we do, making sure that we have, uh, that our residents have access to that technology is really critical, and so we will continue to focus on that and, and updating that information. And then working with many different partners, um, like the Smart Chicago Collaborative, uh, like the libraries, and, and the Connect Chicago Network to continue to support uh, the building of digital skills in our communities. Lastly, sort of area of focus is collaborating and advocacy. Um, so we, um, as you know, uh, try to share the work that we're doing. So we do have a cloud first strategy. Um, so we, if there is a piece of software that exists, we're not going to write our own CRM or our own ERP. But we, we will, if we need to, write a new piece of software. A good example of this was um, the house share legislation that was passed last year, late last year, um, to regulate the, those companies like Airbnb, HomeAway, who um, rent different uh, people's homes. And so there's legislation that was passed, and there's no existing system to support that, that, uh, that the enforcement of that um, legislation. So we actually did build, but we built in an open source way so that it can be shared. Um, and then, you know, we are continuing to work with other cities to advocate um, for things that matter. Uh, we have signed on to letters around, um, support, you know, uh, uh, around net neutrality, for example. Um, we, we care very much about some of the things that are happening at the federal level right now, and we'll continue to advocate with, with uh, other cities um, when, uh, when there's an issue like that. And then lastly, you know, we, we need to talk more about our work in our department. So um, one of the things we're, we're looking forward to doing more often is actually letting people know what the status of the 311 project is, for example, or where are we with smart lighting, doing a better job of, of engaging not just in forums like these, but also online and social media. It can often be a challenge to do that um, with limited resources, but we really think it's important that we're more transparent about the things that we're doing. So we look forward to, to providing more regular updates in different kinds of venues in, in the coming year. And so with that, thank you. Um, and I'll be happy to take questions. Uh, hi, thanks for your talk. Uh, my name is Alex. I uh, used to work in city government. Alex. Hey, um, yeah, we might have even worked together. I think, I, I think we've met before, so yeah. yeah. Um, so one of my favorite pieces of writing on this is by Ramsin Kano. I don't know if you know him, but he is like a Twitter scholar, thinker, and he wrote a piece called Transparency Ex Post and Ex Ante that has really informed a lot of my thinking about this. and. So what it talks about is um, the difference between ex post saying like, okay, here's some data we have that we've decided we want to share it versus ex ante making systems that share data that might be helpful or harmful. So I guess one thing I'm thinking about is, you know, post the Quan McDonald where the city is, you know, the city hall was able to cover up 
a video uh, of a killing of a 16 year old, how can we think about systems in Chicago that surface data more automatically and, and maybe even you know bind some of the systems in our city so that the surface data, even if it could potentially create problems or create embarrassment for politicians? So one of the things we, we do is with all of our contracts, we have data protection terms that we attach to them. And one of the checks we will, so we do different checks, right? We have a security team, and I didn't mention this, but that security is a key area of focus. We just don't talk about it very often. And we have been growing our information security office. So one, we care about privacy and security of information. Two, we, we want to make sure, especially if we're subscribing to software as a service, that we can get the data out, right? So uh, APIs and, is, are really important. And then we also just put in terms that say the data is ours, we have access to it. So just from a basic level, from a contractual level, and also from a technical review level, those are things that we consider whenever we make a decision about a new system that we're, we're going to implement. I hope that answers your question because I think that by, by creating and, and by building systems that enable us to get that information out more easily, that can enable, I think, what you're talking about, right? Because you have to start from the, what you're creating, um, if, if that makes sense. Back here. Really great. Um, I have a question regarding uh, a new tool that they're using for tracking gunshots in Chicago, the shot tracker? This, uh, yes. So is that underneath uh, your department for? So that's actually under the police department, um, but they, they have started to see some, that it is another use of sensors, right? So it's the same idea behind the lighting or, or other things that, you know, we can place sensors in the environment to be more proactive um, rather than reactive. So instead of relying on a 911 call, they know where there are gunshots and it can, they can then target uh, first responders who are close by to come and therefore it is reducing the response times um, as a result of having that, uh, that automatic detection of the gunshots. So yeah, it's called so Shot Spotter. Yeah. So the question I was gonna ask is, it started in Baltimore and they took it down from 21 minutes down to three minutes and when are we going to see that data become publicly available for people to work, build analytics platforms, stuff like that, from the community, which would probably go through your department? You know, we'll be happy to talk to the police department further about that. Hi, Danielle. Thanks for talking. Um, my question is kind of echoing the sentiment of the impact of technology uh, from a holistic perspective, systemic perspective. Um, so from the perspective of human health and the impact of technology on that, um, so for example, smart lighting. Um, I know that there is a huge energy efficiency to be gained um, from moving just to the LED lights, but has there been any consideration about the impact on human health in terms of uh, circadian rhythm, interruption, or hormone production, that sort of thing? So the American Medical Association came out with a paper, I think, uh, and, and made some recommendations about the Kelvin, the, 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 the Kelvin uh, count. So um, the city decided to go with something that was, that was a lower amount in line with the American Medical Association recommendations. And we also had done a demonstration last December, which was at a higher Kelvin level, um, and a different light that ended up being selected and, and, and is being deployed. And, and that demonstration was really useful because we were able to see those lights in different contexts and you know, folks up, these, these are just too bright, right? And it knows our own staff, it was our, our communities. And so based on that demonstration, based on the American Medical Association information, we were able to adjust what we're purchasing. We also um, are not purchasing everything in bulk. So this is a four year project to deploy. So they're purchasing things in such a way that we'll be able to take advantage of changes to the technology where potentially the, the light output or levels as, 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 uh, as the technology gets better, we can consider looking at, at um, that lighting spec uh, again um, if needed. Hi Danielle, thanks for the presentation. Um, you talked a little bit about getting sensor data. 
Um, and I'm wondering if there were any implications to using that data for traffic calming or for any traffic related initiatives. Yeah, so one of the, so the array of things as I talked about most of the other sensors besides these, so there, is, there are two cameras in the array of things. One is pointing up um, and another is pointing at the intersection. So these are all mounted on traffic poles at this point. Um, so there, there's also edge computing and the Waggle platform that was developed by Argon, and so they are working on computer vision techniques to be able to count uh, cars, pedestrians, bikes, uh, identify standing water. So having that information in conjunction also with noise data, um, we may, for example, use that towards vision zero goals, goals of having zero pedestrian deaths. So if we could potentially get data on near misses. So that is one of the potential uses, that's one of the uses um, for the array of things that we'll be uh, looking forward to in the coming year. Great talk. All right, hey. Um, Hi. Great talk, really great. I love that you're making yeah, so available to everybody. And with that in mind, is, is there other levels of government that, and you mentioned do it as well, that you guys are collaborating with to to promote this and expand it? So we we do collaborate with other governments um, on a variety of projects. Probably Tom and, and Nick may have talked a little bit about some of that work in the past. Um, for example, some of the analytics work that the models that his team has built. Um, for example, uh, the food inspections model has been picked up and replicated in several other cities. Um, so there are, are networks of both chief data officers and chief information officers in the cities that we share information and collaborate. Uh, Boston did some interesting things with 311, so we're looking at can that be something we, we implement within our new system. So we do think that there's a lot of value in, in that kind of collaboration, and we shouldn't reinvent the wheel if someone else has done something well one way. Um, I'm curious, uh, I may mean, mention a little bit about your background before you started working at current position, but I'm curious if you could talk about what the most surprising differences between uh, where you used to work versus where you work now, and you mentioned how it took so long to get you hired. <laughs> I wonder if you have any thoughts about that process in terms of like trying to attract different kinds of people to work for government. Yeah, that can be it can be really challenging. I mean, one of the challenges of government is that if a system is abused in some way, what usually happens is they put in different checks and balances to try to make sure that doesn't happen again. So. Um, you know, Chicago had some, some issues and was under a federal monitor for some time. We are no longer under, under that federal monitor. However, that did introduce certain steps into the process. Um, so it can take some time and it's particularly in attracting talent that can be challenging. Um, however, there's still a lot of people who care about our mission and who will commit to that process be, because of that. Um, but would, would it be nicer if it was faster? Sure, absolutely. I think we, uh, we would all be you know, happy to get people on board more quickly so that we can have more, greater impact, um, but we also understand that some of those processes are in place for uh, certain reasons. Hi, uh, my name's Christina and I run Life Lane Uprising. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was wondering if you're taking any um, opportunity to have uh, community groups uh, participating with the prototype of 311's rebrand? Absolutely. If you're interested in participating in that, um, definitely let's connect afterwards and, and we'll get your information. But we'll, we'll be doing uh, different levels of engagement, so community groups, residents, um, so absolutely. Um, as cities move full speed from being data informed to data driven, uh, what are your thoughts about the pitfalls in that? You know, I, I think um, in terms of being data driven, it, it makes more sense to start from a point of information rather than just hypothesizing. So I don't see, I see more pitfalls in the previous way of, of doing things than in, in a being data driven. I also think we have the opportunity to continue to improve in, and, and being proactive instead of reactive as a result of lever better leveraging data as well. Um, you know, things move very quickly, and I think things are changing at a rapid pace. So one of the challenges might be is how do we in more real time be able to, as more and more data is collected, how do we use that information to 
to make the, the best decisions in, in that kind of a quick fashion. So that, that's something I think we'll, we'll start to be grappling with as, as we you know, get more information and are trying to solve uh, any number of challenges. Um, the, you were talking earlier about the cameras being able to watch intersections and see people in your misses and things like that. Uh, how are you protecting uh, like Chicago's privacy? And uh, you know, are we assured that people aren't tracking us around the cities we walk around? Great question. So before any of the nodes started going up, there was actually a privacy set of privacy and governance policies that were developed. Um, so first, we consulted with experts. So folks from the ACLU, the EFF, um, uh, folks at Indiana University uh, who are experts in cybersecurity and privacy um, to develop a, a set of, of policies. And then we made those policies available for public comment. We held some uh, community meetings to discuss them as well and get input. Um, but the policies themselves say that we're, we won't uh, store personally identifiable information. So the goal of this is not to know that you're crossing the street, but rather that there's a person crossing the street. So rather than having uh, infrequent and um, you know, uh, uh, counts that are, you know, we do on a, you know, every 10 years, we now will have better data to, for city planning. But the goal of this isn't to track people. The goal is to, ha to track uh, information about the activities in our environment. So th that, that is covered in the privacy policy, and I encourage you to, to check those out. And certainly, if you have feedback, let us know. And the last question, we'll go to Jean. Oh, wow. High stakes. Uh, so I loved hearing you talk about the 311 system. I think uh, 20 years seems like a really long time, maybe because I'm in my 20s. Uh, but it feels like also for uh, in, in city, in the context of city services, that's in some ways not a really long time. Like many of the, much of the infrastructure that supports our everyday life in the city is a lot older than that. So the, the speed point is really interesting and a little bit terrifying to me because it feels like a lot of the code that I work with these days is, you know, thinking about it on 20 year time spans is uh, scary. Uh, so when you're setting out to modernize, say, like the 311 system, like how do you think about the life cycle of the system coming up? Are you thinking like, okay, in 2040, maybe we'll start, we'll revisit this again? Or are you thinking, actually, we need to start looking at this uh, kind of sooner? What, what does that process look like? So I think more often than not now, we opt for software as a service where we're automatically getting updates to that um, software as you know the developers create them, right? So rather than having deploying something on premise and heavily customizing it, so it makes it difficult to maintain, um, you know we are opting for systems that uh, can be easily configured and that we can easily train staff to make changes to. But then we're also getting the benefits of the updates that are coming as a result of the, the platform uh, and the way it's managed.